May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Many of you were here a couple of weeks ago and heard the excellent parish hall presentation by the Reverend Bob Zito who spoke about the relationship between business, that is, what we do for a living, and religion, or what we do to obey and please God. His professional background was as a Wall Street lawyer, but he later became a deacon in the Episcopal Church in New York, and now is a law professor at Marist University. He began his talk by saying that there is something we rarely, if ever, discuss in our Christian churches. And he demonstrated this by going to a poster board where he wrote in large block letters, S-I-N. And he defined sin basically as anything we do individually or corporately that separates us from the love and the mercy of God. And he paused for a moment and then went back to his board and drew two vertical lines through the letter S, making, obviously, it into a dollar sign and leaving us to infer that the acquisition of wealth and the ways in which we use it can become a form of idolatry thereby separating us from the love of God and the love of our fellow man. But lest we conclude that making money is bad, Bob went on to temper his remarks by indicating that God does want us to prosper and partake of all the resources he has given us to be safe and secure and to be able to provide for our families. It is only when we begin to think that God's abundance is not enough for us and when most of our thoughts and efforts center around getting more and more stuff that such activity begins to distance us from God. Today's lesson, at least on the surface, is about money and wealth. It is about preserving and expanding capital. It is a parable, one from which the disciples and those of us who hear it today should gain some meaning and some guidance about how we should conduct our lives. And as the collect we heard just a few minutes ago informs us, we are to read, mark, and inwardly digest Scripture. We are to interpret it in ways that reflect the teachings of Jesus. So what does this parable of the talents teach us? The story describes an extremely wealthy man who is going away on a long journey. And he leaves a considerable portion of his money in the hands of three of his slaves. And although he does not give them explicit instructions, It is implied that they are to invest that money wisely so that he will realize significant and profitable gains when he returns. Incidentally, one talent was worth 6,000 denarii, or the equivalent of 20 years of wages for the average worker in the first century Palestine. It was an inordinate an unlikely amount of money to be left with a slave. The story, therefore, is a form of hyperbole, which employs a bit of exaggeration in order to make a point more emphatic. The first two slaves were able to double their money and therefore gain the favor and the praise of their master when he returned. The third, wicked and lazy slave, did not invest his one talent, content only to to preserve his master's original money by burying it in the ground. He therefore incurred his master's wrath 
and he was banished into the outer darkness, possibly leading to destitution, even death. With whom in this story should we identify? The first two fiscally faithful and successful slaves or the lazy third slave who do, did nothing to improve his master's resources. Many have interpreted this parable as seeing God or Jesus as the wealthy master who provides rich resources to his followers and expects them to be held accountable for preserving those resources just as we, members of the Christian community, are to be held accountable for all the gifts God has given us. This text has often been a favorite to preach on Stewardship Sunday when we are asked to invest our time, our talents, and our resources in the church in order to sustain it and to help advance God's kingdom on earth. Such a sermon suggests that those who bury their talents and do not invest their resources, resources for growth are not truly faithful servants and at that time are being asked to reconsider making an investment. This parable of the talents is, parable, is parallel to the one we heard last week when the foolish bridesmaids were unprepared and were not allowed into the wedding banquet. And it will also foreshadow one we'll hear soon about the sheep and the goats. In that passage about Judgment Day, the sheep will be directed to the right into the kingdom of heaven, the goats to the left, to that other place where it's very hot. None of these parables is really about who does or does not get into heaven. They are about how we are to live our lives until the master Jesus returns. It is about how we are to preserve and to use the gifts God has given us. Now most of you have probably seen pictures of optical illusions. Those in which you see one thing at, on first glance but something else when looked at from a different perspective. You may see the picture of a beautiful flowering tree, but after reading the instructions from the maker of that picture, you may see the face of a young woman. I submit that this parable today is a bit like the optical illusion, that reading it in the traditional way, as was the basis for a stewardship type sermon, does not address some of the issues and the discrepancies that arise from reading it more than once. Some concerns are as follows. First, enormous sums of money were entrusted to the slaves, and the master's sole advice to them seems to have been that they should just make money in order to increase his net worth, at the very least a, very, a, a moderately secular message. Second, the master is described as a harsh man, an adjective that would never have been applied to Jesus if, as some have suggested, he was actually the master in this story who went away on a long journey. In the parable, the master, by his own admission, reaped what he did not sow, suggesting that he benefited by exploiting others and profited through the work done by others. Now for those of you who were fortunate enough to attend Hester's presentation just about an hour ago, you'll know that from the paintings of Vincent van Gogh, the sower was good, the reaper was bad. <laughs> In Jesus' time, the culture and the economy was one of limited goods. To be able to increase one's wealth was to do so at the expense of someone else losing theirs. Those in the top income group would make money by offering loans with enormous interest rates to the poor. And when they could not pay, 
would have their lands and possessions seized. The parable ends by saying that those who have, more will be given. And those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. How fair is that? That's definitely not the way Jesus would have wanted things to happen. That brings us back to the third slave who was punished for not playing the game of his master. So what if we see him in a different light, from a different perspective? What if he alone is the righteous one in this story? He alone recognized that the system was corrupt, that his master was evil, and was intent only in securing and bolstering his own fortune. The third slave refused to participate in the dishonesty and the cheating that was going on, feeling that money should not be used as a weapon against homes and farms and families. He did not cheat or lie to his master, but he did confront that master with the stark truth and the unfair consequences of his actions. And for that, he was thrown into the outer darkness, possibly resulting in his own death. Now here's a final and thought-provoking idea. What if the third slave actually represents Jesus, who stood up against evil, confronted wrongdoers, promoted justice, and suggested that love be the guiding force in our lives? For all of this, he too was banished to the outer darkness of Good Friday and the cross. Third slave, thank you. You have taught us all a lesson in truth and righteousness. Amen.